Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that I've been following pretty much since the very beginning. This case was suggested to me quite a long time ago and there wasn't a lot of information to go off of when I first started looking into it, but it's been quite a while in this case without any movement, at least publicly. So I thought that there was no better time than now to get her story out there and spread her information. I think this is a case that definitely has the potential to be solved. I think it can and it will be solved as long as the right people see her information and do the right things. So I hope that by making this video, I can help spread awareness to this case and make those things happen and finally bring justice to her and her family. But before we go ahead and get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare has been a huge supporter of this channel and I am so grateful for that. Skillshare can help you make 2022 a year of new learning, investing in your own personal growth, and making new connections through creativity. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who loves to learn and explore their creativity like I do. If you've been looking to spruce up your creativity on things that you're already passionate about, or if there's something that you've always wanted to start learning, Skillshare is a great place to start. They have thousands of classes for creative and curious people on topics like illustration, graphic design, art, photography, film and video, and so much more. Even beyond that, Skillshare even has classes that can help you level up in your current role, whether you're an entrepreneur or a freelancer. Skillshare is an amazing way to help you learn new skills to improve your side hustle or even launch yourself into a new creative career with classes like Support Your Creative Career by Sonia Rossola and Finding Fulfillment Using Pivots to Power Your Creative Career by Emma Gannon, which is the class that I am currently taking. This class is about pivoting your life and taking those very scary risks to just get out of your comfort zone and thrust yourself into new creative projects. She has lessons on time management, financial planning, and rediscovering your passions so that you can take those steps towards becoming responsible for your own goals and aspirations. I'm someone who has a lot of difficulty with stepping out of my comfort zone and taking the steps towards structuring my life in the more creative and passionate way that I want to. There were so many things in my life that I knew that I wanted to change, things in my own personal life and things with my YouTube channel, but I just wasn't sure how to do them. And then once I did, you know, trying new things is really uncomfortable and it's really scary and I just wasn't quite sure how to take that leap. But this class has been a huge part in helping me learn how to make those calculated moves to progress things in the direction that I want them to go. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, meaning that there are no ads and new premium classes are launched every single week, so there is always something new to discover. That is one of my favorite things about Skillshare. If you're a sponge like me and you want to learn something new all the time and you want to know everything about everything, everything and you have a new interest every week, Skillshare is a great place to start. Skillshare's catalog is also now available with subtitles in Spanish, French, Portuguese, and German. Prioritize your self-care and wellness by investing in yourself and finding new ways to learn and be creative and relax with new skills and passions. The first 1,000 of my subscribers that click the link in the description box below will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare so that you can start exploring your creativity today. Thank you again so much to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. So with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the case of Allison Watterson. Allison Joy Watterson was born on June 6, 1999 to her parents, Misty and Allen, in Portland, Oregon, and she had an older brother named Blake. She grew up in Hillsborough, Oregon, and graduated from Hillsborough High School in 2017. She was incredibly close to her family and her mom referred to her as her best friend and her soulmate. Allison was described as being a kind-hearted young woman who made friends easily and saw the best in people, even to a fault where it took a lot for Allison to have any negative thoughts or comments towards anybody. Allison enjoyed swimming, exploring the beach, baking, and loved celebrating holidays. She was super energetic and she loved school, but more so for the social aspect. She didn't really like doing actual schoolwork, but she loved that she got to talk to her friends and hang out all day. She loved having sleepovers with her friends, going on adventures outside with her family, and doing her makeup. She stood for what she believed in wholeheartedly, and she fought for animals, children, and anybody else who needed help. She had big dreams and aspirations 
aspirations of becoming a vet. But around the time that she went missing, she was just sort of trying to enjoy her 20s. Her mom described her as being a bit of a hippie girl, just out there trying to live her life. So after graduating, she stayed living at home and wasn't totally interested in starting college right away. So her and her mom came to the agreement that she could live at home and just worry about finding herself for a while as long as she went out and worked a part-time job. Now, around the time that she disappeared, she actually did not have a part-time job, but she was about to have an interview for a job that she was really excited about on the day that she was reported missing on December 23rd, 2019. Her and her mother also had an agreement that if Allison was gonna go out, that she would be in constant contact with her mother and let her know where she was at all times. The two saw each other pretty much every single day and they really enjoyed each other's company. They were so close, so this agreement didn't bother Allison at all. At the time of the disappearance, Allison was dating a man named Ben Garlin. The two had known each other since high school, they were friends in high school, and had recently reconnected. But her parents were not too happy when they learned about their relationship. He had a criminal record, which involved drugs, and he used drugs regularly. Her parents said that they also didn't really like how he treated Allison. He seemed to only be interested in talking to her or coming by when he wanted sex or when he needed a ride from her. It seems like they had a very toxic relationship with this cycle of breaking up and making up, and it seemed like the pattern was not going to end anytime soon. Allison pretty much had always encouraged him to get help for his drug use and go into a drug treatment program, but he never did. So the week prior to her disappearance, Allison gave Ben an ultimatum. She told him that she loved him, but they could only have a future together if he cleaned up his act. After this, she told him that she needed a break and the two did not speak for the following eight days. Now, she was feeling pretty down the entire week after this argument. Of course, they had just broken up or taken a break, but she was starting to feel a little bit better, was starting to act like her normal self again, and was going back out and hanging out with friends, or so she told her mom. On Friday, December 20th, 2019, at around 4 p.m., Allison left the house after telling her mom that she was gonna go hang out with some friends, naming one friend, Carissa, as someone that she was gonna be hanging out with. She told her mom that she would be home later that day and then left, and her mom seemed perfectly fine with this. However, Allison actually went and hung out with Ben. She had recently rekindled the relationship, but she did not tell her mom about this because she knew that her mother would not approve. So by that evening, after not hearing from Allison that entire day, her mom Misty texted her to ask her where she was, and that is when she admitted that she was actually hanging out with Ben and that she wasn't gonna be home that evening, instead she'd be home the next day. But after this, her family had not seen or heard from her again. According to later statements, it was found that on that Saturday, so the next day after the two had been hanging out for a while, Ben's mother, Molly, had dropped the two off at a train station at around 11 p.m. that night. Then early that next morning, December 22nd at 5.35 a.m., both Allison and Ben showed up at a fire station saying that they had just been robbed at Knife Point on 15th Avenue, which is around two blocks away from the fire station. So of course, the people who worked at the firehouse asked Ben and Allison if they wanted them to call the police, but both of them said no. Ben then called his mother Molly to ask her if she could come pick them up. Then at the same time, of course, Either way, even though Ben and Allison said no, the fire station did call the police anyways. They had apparently both just been robbed at knife point, so there was really no reason not to call the police, so that is why they did that. So Ben's mom, Molly, showed up to pick them up just before the police arrived. So at this point, Ben actually did have a warrant out for his arrest, but apparently there's a law in Oregon that says that if they aren't actively committing a crime, you don't have to tell police who you are or provide them with an ID. So when police showed up and asked Ben who he was and asked for his ID, he didn't tell them who he was and they would not give him an ID. Then after this, he got into the car with his mother. But Allison did talk to police and they asked her if either of them needed any help and she said no, but she also did not provide her ID. Now, apparently there is body cam footage of this interaction that her family saw. I haven't personally seen it, but according to Allison's family, she looked pretty normal in the video. 
no signs of distress, no signs of physical harm or anything like that. So then Allison joined Ben and his mom in the car and they drove off and I don't think anything further was done because again, they didn't want to press any charges. So there was really nothing else that police could do. After this, them and Molly had made a couple of stops, I guess errands around the town before ultimately being dropped off at a nearby Winco grocery store. In this parking lot of the grocery store, Ben actually stole a red pickup truck. By 9 a.m. on the same day, Ben and Allison parked the red pickup truck on the side of the road and then walked over to a nearby farmhouse on Pumpkin Ridge Road in North Plains. This house was owned by a woman named Sally. So the two walked up to the door, knocked on it, and here they told Sally that they had just gotten into a car accident and asked her if they could use her phone. So of course she said yes. When they were in there, Allison asked her for a glass of water. Now at this point, Sally noted that Allison looked pretty dirty. She had mud in her hair and she was wearing Ben's shoes while Ben was wearing only socks. Later, according to Allison's mom, at some point when Molly was driving them around that morning, I guess Allison had taken off her shoes and left them wherever she took them off. So she ended up losing them. So that is why she was wearing Ben's shoes. So from Sally's house, Ben called his grandmother and asked if she could come pick them up and she agreed. However, by the time Ben Ben's grandmother arrived at the house, both Ben and Allison had left. No one really knows why they left or where they actually went, but reports would later came out that said that a FedEx driver actually saw them walking towards the woods from Sally's house. But for the time between this and the next morning, we have no idea what really happened. So the next morning on Monday, December 23rd, a neighbor of Sally's named Ralph found Ben sleeping in the bed of his truck and Ben was soaking wet. When Ralph asked Ben what he was doing there in the bed of his truck, he told Ralph that basically all of his friends had left him and that Allison had left him by himself in the woods and that he was in the truck because he was out all night by himself and he was trying to take cover from the rain. So Ralph decided to take Ben and drive him back to his parents' house. When Ben got home, obviously he was still soaking wet and according to his mom, he looked rough. He looked disheveled. There was blood on him. He had peed himself and he was clearly on meth. He also apparently was saying things like he wanted to take his own life, things like that, and he clearly was not in a very good mental state. Later that day, his father, Don Garland, had gotten home from work at around noon, and of course he asked him what happened. He told him that the two were just in the woods when they had gotten separated and that Allison had just left him there. But then Ben changed his story and said that he's actually the one that left Allison in the woods. Eventually he changed his story again and said that Allison was actually arrested while they were walking in the woods and that is why they got separated, but there was actually no record of her ever being arrested. Molly claims that after hearing this, she started calling numerous police stations, hospitals, and other things like that to see if she was there, and of course she wasn't, so she knew that Allison hadn't been arrested. So clearly at this point, Ben was lying about something. Later in the day, Don called 911 to report Allison as missing about 30 hours after she was last seen. The family then apparently went over to Pumpkin Ridge Road where Ben said that he last saw her to start looking around for her and see if they could figure out where exactly she went but they could not find anything that led them to Allison. After searching and knowing that she was missing for several hours, by 5.30 p.m. that same day, the Garland family finally reached out to Allison's mother, Misty, to let her know that Allison was missing. This was after Misty had already been worried for quite a while. She kind of had a feeling, so she had been reaching out to a bunch of Allison's friends, asking around to see if any of them had heard from Allison, and of course they hadn't. According to Misty, while she was asking around, she had also reached out to Molly, Ben's mother, who initially told her that she did see her, that she had been driving her around to the different areas when she was last seen. Now, I don't know the exact timeline of this, when she said this versus when they reported her missing, so I don't know if she continued on with this, saying this after they knew that she was missing to maybe cover her tracks or while they were searching for her, or whatever, but still, several hours had passed before the Garland family even bothered to tell Misty that her daughter was missing. And when they did, I believe Molly did tell her the hiking story that Ben had originally told her, basically saying that the two were hiking in the woods when the two got separated, that Allison left him behind, or that he left Allison behind, 
and that's the last time that he saw her. But the thing about all of this, according to Misty, is that this hiking story simply did not make any sense to her. As far as she knew, both of them were visiting a mutual friend that weekend, not out hiking in the woods for no reason. She said that to her understanding, she thought that the reason that the two got separated was because they were driving the car to go visit a friend when the car broke down. So the two got out of the car and then went their separate ways to go search for help for their broken down car and that is when they got lost and separated. But there was no evidence of any broke down car in the area, so that couldn't have been the case either. Misty was also very upset that Molly didn't tell her that her daughter was missing right away. She said that if Molly would have just reached out to her right away, that she could have left work right then and there and came out to help search for her. But either way, by Tuesday, December 24th, so Christmas Eve, police called out the search and rescue team who set out to search the area for Allison. Over the next five days, hundreds of volunteers came out to help with the search. They also had the National Guard and searched any nearby property that they could. They used sniffer dogs to try and track Allison's scent, and they did pick her scent up on Pumpkin Ridge Road. But after following her trail, they did lose her scent, so this didn't really bring them anywhere. Misty was actually very happy from the support that they were getting from the community. Everyone was kind of banding together to try to figure out what happened to Allison, but there was one person in particular who she was very upset with, and this person was Ralph, the same guy who drove Ben home after finding him in the bed of his truck. So he was actually caught on surveillance video later ripping down Allison's missing persons flyers. He went on to say that Allison's family had been harassing him and making it seem like he had something to do with her disappearance. So he was really upset with the backlash that he was getting from this. He said that he was just a really nice person and he was just trying to be nice and drive Ben home, not really knowing the backstory of everything else that was going on. So I do understand that if they're putting undue blame on him saying, you know, you drove home someone that had something to do with my daughter's disappearance, you know, I can see how he would get upset with that, get upset with the backlash but you don't need to take your frustration out by ripping down missing persons flyers from a family who's just desperately trying to find this missing person. Doing this obviously just makes it seem like he has something to hide and that for whatever reason, he doesn't want anybody knowing that she's missing. So that's a bit strange that he's doing that. It could be connected, but I do also understand his reasoning, I guess. Not that it's justified, but I don't think this automatically means that he's guilty and that he had something to do with it. Again, I understand what he's saying, doesn't make it right, but I don't think this points towards him being responsible for anything. So as all of this was going on, the day after Allison was last seen, Ben was actually arrested on unrelated charges regarding unauthorized use of a motor vehicle, fraudulent use of a credit card, and second degree theft. He is currently serving three years for this. However, according to Misty, even when they were trying to arrest him on these charges, he was being very difficult and uncooperative. He was out in the woods at this time, and when police came looking for him and trying to speak with him, he ran and hid behind the bushes. Police yelled to him and told him to be a man and to come out, and so he ultimately did, and at that point, he was arrested. For six months, these searches were not bringing them anywhere closer to finding Allison, However, on June 20th of 2020, Allison's body was discovered. So the person who found Allison's body actually said that she noticed a shoe near her property as she was just walking along outside. She said that after seeing the shoe, which turned out to be Ben's shoe, the Ben's shoe that Allison was wearing that day that we discussed earlier, she kept walking further until she noticed Allison's body in the bushes. She was found in a blackberry bush near Pumpkin Ridge, several hundred yards away from the main road. She was located wearing her yellow mustard sweater inside out, and then they did locate her pants and her underwear, but I'm not sure if she was wearing them. I've just seen that they were located but her undershirt was actually missing and I don't think that was ever found and neither was her cell phone. Now, just as a quick side note, Allison was only able to use her cell phone if it was connected to Wi-Fi. If she didn't have Wi-Fi, she wasn't able to contact anybody or get on social media or anything like that. So that's why throughout the entire search, they were not able to track her location based on her cell phone pings because there weren't any. 
But still, Allison always had her phone with her and it was very strange to her family that it was missing. To this day, the family has set up several searches to try to find this phone, but they have never been able to find it. So now going back, now that Ben was arrested on unrelated charges, Misty decided to go ahead and visit him in jail and try to get him to talk about what happened. When he saw Misty, the first thing that came out of Ben's mouth were, I'm very sorry, Misty, I'm very sorry. He went on to tell Misty that him and Allison had been walking through the woods for several hours when Allison heard a dog barking. He said that at that point, Allison thought that they were being chased by police and so she panicked and she said, I'm turning myself in, and that is when she just took off. He said that after that, he found himself wrestling with a blackberry bush before falling asleep in it. I don't know what he supposedly meant by this, but that's all he said. But even after telling Misty this, he still went on to tell other friends and fellow inmates that he simply left Allison behind because they had been walking through the woods and Allison was too tired to go on. At this point, Allison's family was just so frustrated that she was missing and that she was later found in an area that was so close to other houses in an area that she could have gotten help from somebody. They're frustrated that either nobody noticed her or that for some reason she wasn't able to go get help for herself. They're frustrated that Ben's story just keeps changing and they're frustrated that even if his story of leaving her behind is true, they're frustrated that he left her behind to begin with and still finds him responsible. They're just so frustrated with everything in this case. So other than this, there really isn't much more information to go off of in Allison's case. There are a couple of main theories and a lot of questions in this case, and of course, they pretty much all surround Ben. So we know that she was last seen by her mom on Friday, December 20th. Then she was seen by a witness with this stolen truck and then they went to that fire station to report that they had been robbed at knife point by that Sunday. Then we know that they went to Sally's house to ask to use her phone, but then after this, Allison is not seen again. We know that Ben was the very last person known to have seen her before he was found in this pickup truck and then was driven home by Ralph. We know that he was wrecked when his mom saw him. He had peed himself, he was on drugs, and he was in a very bad place mentally. The other thing that I wanna mention before we get into theories is that I have not seen anything in relation to any autopsy results. I have seen that they used an autopsy to confirm her identity, but I haven't seen mentioned anywhere if they're finding a cause of death, if they're trying to find a cause of death, if she had anything in her system, if there were any marks on her or anything else like that. Like I haven't seen it mentioned anywhere that they're planning to release anything or even that they're trying to find the cause of death. So that makes it even more difficult to come up with theories and try to answer a lot of these unanswered questions. So the first theory is that the two were walking into the woods, for whatever reason, and then the two got separated and he left her behind and then, you know, she was by herself and she just couldn't find her way out, she couldn't find her way back, so she died of the elements. According to her family and others who live in the area, the woods are very thick, dense, and they're very easy to get lost in. So if Ben had just left her behind, it does seem possible that she could easily just get lost and was not able to find her way out. But then the question is, why did he leave her behind? Was there an argument and he just got frustrated and took off? How come he was able to find his way out to the point of finding somebody's truck to lay in, but for whatever reason, she wasn't able to find her way out and find any houses or anybody else to ask them for help? Those are the biggest questions that I and pretty much everybody else who knows this case are asking. And for those reasons, I almost feel like this theory just doesn't make any sense. The other idea going off of this though is that what if what Ben said about her worrying about being arrested is true? Now we know that at least Ben had an issue with using meth and that he was a regular user. I almost wonder if he had convinced Allison to try it that day and then being on meth for maybe the first time, maybe not, I don't know, but maybe when she was on meth she gets very, very paranoid because we know that meth is known for making the user very paranoid. Maybe in her paranoia she ran off and then, you know, she thought she was being arrested or something like that. 
she went and hid in the bushes and you know because she was on drugs she just hid in the bushes for so long that she got hypothermia and that is how she passed away and if she was on meth that could make sense why she didn't necessarily realize that she was in danger why she shouldn't be out in the elements and that can explain why she wouldn't have gotten shelter and you know realize that her body was actually suffering from being so cold it's december in oregon it's gonna be freezing there's gonna be snow there's gonna be ice so the fact that she was only wearing a sweater at the time is very concerning that can definitely mean that she died of hypothermia and again if she was on drugs that can make sense why she'd be out there and why she wouldn't have asked for help so i do think that that can be possible and it can explain a couple of different things in this case and it also could explain why ben is so against telling the full truth when he tells his stories it's clear that he's changing up details and so it's clear that he's hiding something when people lie though, they typically mix in, you know, little bits of the truth so that it's easier to remember and so that, you know, if they're ever caught lying, they can point to these bits and pieces as being true. So if we want to say for the sake of argument that, you know, she really did get paranoid and that she really did go run off and that he had no idea, you know, where she went and that's why he left, then what does he have to hide? Why isn't he telling the full truth? Well, if he provided her drugs that ultimately caused her to get lost and die from the elements, he knows he can probably get in trouble for that. Maybe if he gave her too much or gave her something that maybe she didn't consent to. What if he gave her meth that had something else mixed in with it that she had no idea that she was taking? Or even beyond that, what if she didn't want meth? What if she was completely against taking meth in the first place, so he offered her weed, which wasn't really weed. Maybe it was weed with meth mixed into it or something mixed into it, and that's what caused her to get paranoid and then run off. Obviously, he can get in trouble for giving her something that she didn't consent to taking. Or if she overdosed on it right in front of him, obviously he can get in trouble for giving her something that she overdosed on. And then adding to the mix, if he was on meth himself, that also would make him very paranoid. Even if at that point he legally didn't have any responsibility for you know her death, if she took it willingly, if she overdosed herself, all those things, he on meth could think, you know, I'm gonna get in trouble for this. I could you know go to jail for this and I don't wanna go to jail. So I'm just gonna pretend like I have no idea what happened. These things are all just ideas that are going through my head as why Allison would just happen to run off and why Ben would want to be hiding certain parts of the story to save his own butt. So in terms of the theory of her just running off and then dying to the elements, I would definitely lean more towards the second one being true of her being on something, whether it was, you know, something that she wanted to be on or not, and then her dying and then Ben just wanting to cover that up to save his own butt. Because again, somebody who's totally innocent doesn't just lie. They don't just hide things for absolutely no reason. If it truly were a case of him just, you know, leaving her behind because she was too tired, or if she really just ran off and, you know, he left and he just felt really guilty, maybe, you know, oh, I left her behind, I really shouldn't have, I'm really kicking myself for that, you know, if that were the case, then his story would not have changed. It would have been that from the very beginning. I will say, you know, just for the sake of argument, if he was on math at that time, and that's why his story keeps changing because he genuinely doesn't remember, or because he might have experienced it differently than what it really happened because he was on drugs, all of that can definitely play into it. Again, for the sake of argument, you know, just saying things to be fair and not just pointing fingers where they don't belong. I guess that could be what's possible, not saying it is, but all of these things are just things that I wanna consider as we go through these theories. So the other theory, of course, is that he did something to her and he is directly responsible for her death. We know that when he showed up at home, his mom saw some blood on him and he was soaking wet. He said that he wrestled a bush, which doesn't make any sense to me. So I feel like, again, that could have some truth to it, but I don't think that that's the full truth. So what I'm wondering with this is what if he pushed her? What if he pushed her into a bush and then wrestled with her in the bush? And that's how he got all the cuts on him because maybe he really was in the bush and maybe they cut him and that's why he was bleeding, but he was really wrestling her because maybe they got into a fight. Maybe he pushed her. Any of those possible things could be why they would both end up in the bush, wrestle within the bush, and then she would later be found in a bush. I don't think it's a coincidence that he said he was wrestling with a bush and then her body would later go on to be found in a bush. Maybe as they were walking through the woods, the two had gotten into an argument and then something escalated from there. 
we know that she had literally broken up with him or at least taken a break from him and given him an ultimatum eight days before this all happened. It's very likely that he could have still been upset about all of that and that maybe he even hung out with her with, you know, the motive that, you know, if I can't have you, nobody can. Or maybe they were hanging out and, you know, the two had been having a day together and, you know, rekindling things, whatever. Maybe he was taking drugs and she didn't want to. And maybe at that point she realized, you know, he's never gonna stop, he's never gonna get clean. So they had an argument about that and that is when it escalated. I personally lean more towards this being an escalation of some sorts. I don't think he planned all of this because I think, you know, obviously he doesn't seem like a very smart person, but I feel like if it were planned, it would have been planned better. Don't think they would have made all these stops first. I think it would have been, you know, something where he sees her and then does something to her and then leaves, whatever. But that is why I think it's more possible that this was like a second degree murder, you know, in the heat and the passion type of thing. I think if they did get into an argument or had some sort of exchange like that, he killed her either on purpose in the moment or it was an accident. And then, you know, obviously he just left her there and then ran off and was panicking and all that. And everything happened after that, the way that his mom said with him being soaking wet and peeing himself and being covered in blood because of what he just did. I think all of those things together could be exactly what happened in this case. So for me, those really are the main ideas in this case. Either she took something that she shouldn't have and she died because of that and he's trying to cover his tracks because he gave her something that he shouldn't have given her that maybe she didn't consent to taking or he's just worried that he's gonna be connected to it in some way or something happened by accident and he feels so guilty that he's trying to cover it up or he did something to her on purpose or by accident and he's trying to cover that up. I personally don't think it's worth talking about anybody else being involved in this for whatever reason because I don't think anything else points to that. I think it's obvious that whatever happened in this case has something to do with Ben. Whether it was an accident or not, whether he's directly involved or not, those are the main theories, those are the main options, and I think that something along those lines is what happened. I think what's most likely to me is that something happened and that he's just desperately trying to cover his tracks. Either something caused them to go in the woods and then start arguing and something happened or after they were already in the woods, something happened and it escalated. Maybe they were on drugs throughout this entire timeline that we know and that's why they said that they were mugged and that's why they just you know, called Ben's grandma and then just left for no reason because honestly, none of this timeline really even makes any sense. And there are a lot of bizarre behaviors that are surrounding this entire thing. So given all of these strange behaviors and this very weird timeline with a lot of unexplained things throughout, I do think it's possible that drugs are involved, whether, you know, both of them were on them or just Ben. But otherwise, I truly don't know what I think happened and I really can't explain this very strange timeline. So that is pretty much where the case ends for now. The family is still desperately searching for answers and I truly hope that they find what they're looking for soon. And I truly think that they will. I believe one of the investigators on this case said that they themselves believe that this is a lot more than just a random happenstance instance. So that just gives me a lot of hope that they're still looking into this case and doing what they can to bring justice to her and her family. I just hope that spreading more information about Allison's case and bringing her case more attention and awareness can help bring Allison and her family closer to finding justice. But with that, I'm really looking forward to hearing your guys' thoughts what do you think really happened in this case? Do you think that it was an accident or not? And do you think that Ben is hiding something? If so, what? Let's discuss the thoughts and theories in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe and stay healthy. And I hope to see you next time. Bye.